forward to this computer. Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Welcome to uh, your first lecture, uh, which is going to be online for a time due to our uh, recent surge in Omicron COVID cases. Uh, as you guys probably know, we're scheduled to do an online lecture together until about February 14th. And if things quiet down from there, uh, we'll be moving back in person. Uh, I wanna mention that this, this class is a mixture of students who are in my daytime course, that's section 001, but I've also opened the session up to my nighttime students, section 102, and I even have an online class, section 600, which is supposed to be, you know, pre-recorded distance learning videos. But since I'm going to be doing these live, I figured I'd uh, invite you guys to join the party if you're into that kind of thing. Um, I want to do something here. I'm glad that a few of you are sharing video with me, Fred. And um, my friend whose name is iPad, could you change it to your name so I know how to talk to you? The dude with the headphones, can you? Your name is iPad. That's not, yeah. <laughs> See if you can rename yourself. Vincent and Whitney and Paige and Caitlin and Emma. I like seeing I like seeing you all. Uh, I need to do this thing. I need to hide the trolls. How do I hide the trolls? It's been just a little while since I did this. Jeez, guys, I feel like a fish out of water here. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to fix it real quick. Give me a second. I'm just trying to figure it out because this is my first time in Zoom. Okay. Yeah, I figured everyone was used to this now, having done this last year, but some of you might be new to the college experience. So welcome to the, welcome to the mess. Welcome to what's going on. Uh, for the life of me, though, I, I realize how rusty I am. And I'm, I'm a little embarrassed, but I participants. I'm a little embarrassed, but I forgot how to hide non-video participants. I used to know how to do that. Well, maybe I'll just have to let it go. Uh, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm a little rustier at this than I thought I was going to be. Share screen, advanced sharing options. I think that's uh, that's okay, Mikey. Uh, 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 did you know the name the, change? Sorry. Uh, did the name change by any by any chance? Yeah. How All do you right, say? It? Is it Li Lionel? Yeah, that's about it. My mom kind of screwed up on the spelling. I like it. No, you know what? It's unique. It's just it's all you. Thanks. You know, there's only one you, Lionel. Uh, Thanks. Are you able to like right click and hide video participants? I'm so, I'm really off to a, a very ugly start here, guys. So I'm going to try one more thing. Uh, uh, advanced. <laughs> Non-video participants. Okay, well, I have to let it go. I, I don't know why. I used to be able to just right-click, I think, but they've changed something. I love it when they do that. Okay, so uh, before we get going here, uh, I want to start talking about something important. Uh, I want to share my screen, share audio. And you guys should be able to see my uh, PowerPoints now. And I'd like to start with function F5, this slide here. Uh, most of you guys are, are new to me, to my class and this whole scene. So I want to know if uh, any of you guys know what the difference is between astronomy versus astrology. Maybe this will be our first set of notes. Now, listen, every time I write some things down on this board, you should probably write that down in your notebooks and keep track of it. That's gonna turn out to be a smart thing to do. So hopefully you guys will be able to read my whiteboard. Uh, ASTR 1020. And our first set of notes is gonna be on 
astronomy. Let's see, stop the share screen for a second. Astronomy versus astrology. Hey, I should mention, uh, one of the students at least mentioned that this is their first time doing a live Zoom class. Um, I'm a little all thumbs with this myself, but on the upper right corner is a button called view. And you can switch between gallery view where you see your friends in Hollywood squares mode, or you can switch to speaker view. For note taking, you wanna switch to speaker view. And then I think you either double click or you right click and, uh, and you should lock the speaker view or you pin my, me or something like that. That way I fill up your whole screen and that should make the note taking a little bit easier. So hopefully you guys can read this and we won't have too many focus issues. Anyways, uh, that's okay. Do your thing, Emma. Uh, okay, so uh, astronomy versus astrology. Tell me something about the difference between these two things. I need to know what you guys know so I can decide how fast or slow I should be going here. Well, astronomy is like the study of like the stars, space, um, anything like within space itself, more focused on the stars. I mean, it really depends on what subtype you're like focusing on. Astrology is more like a pseudoscience based on like zodiac signs and celestial events, like talking about like your personality and birth charts. That's pretty good, Caitlin. Actually, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, astronomy is 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 a study of it's a, it's a physical science and it studies stars and planets and galaxies. Whereas astrology is a pseudoscience concerned with your zodiac signs and your you know Capricorn. I like to think of your uh, everyday astrologer as someone who looks like this, okay? This is what an astrologer looks like. And uh, the message of astrology goes uh, a little something like this. Uh, everything's going to be great. You will be rich, okay? So now you know what an astrologer astrologer looks like. Uh, on the other hand, this is what I like to think of as an astronomer. This is uh, a legendary astronomer, Edwin Hubble, looking all cool at the Mount Palomar Observatory, where he has recently discovered that the universe is expanding when he measured the velocities of galaxies uh, with respect to the Milky Way. And astronomers have a different kind of message for you. It sounds a little more like this. The world is going to end and everyone's going to die when the sun enters its red giant phase. So you can see right away that the message of astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message uh, of astrology is. And for some reason, people get these things confused, uh, probably because, you know, they have to do with constellations and things like that. Uh, but they're very different sorts of uh, subjects, right? You can read about your, uh, your, uh, your sign in, in, in a local magazine or a, a magazine like this Dell horoscope here. And you can learn things about balancing mind, body, and spirit. Uranus moves into Pisces. Expect the unexpected, okay? Um, to, to read an article about astronomy, you'd want to go to a slightly more ambitious publication, uh, something like Science or Nature or the Astrophysical Journal. These are peer-reviewed uh, peer-reviewed articles where in order to get published in, in this magazine, you need to first do something. You have to go out and you know use a telescope and collect some data and test some hypotheses. And then once you've discovered something, you have to, you have to write up your results and, and submit it to a body of enemy professors who are out to get you. And once they've sort of checked over your research with a fine tooth comb, they might allow you to publish in a magazine like this. We call this the threshold for publication. The threshold for publication in a magazine like Science is quite high. They don't just let any old Tom, Dick, or Harry sort of uh, uh, spot off their theories of the universe. On the other hand, the threshold for publication in, in CoStar or in your local astrology column is, is probably not quite as high. You know, you probably... You walk into the office and you say to your editor, bro, I'm really deeply in touch with the stars. And the editor says, I love it. You know, 50 cents a word, your deadline's Monday, something like that. So that's how you get published in something like this. Or you just make an app and you get your friends to, to pay for it. And anyways, um, why do people get astrology and astronomy confused? I think because they, they both have to do superficially with 
with some constellations. And here, if you guys can see my uh, slideshow, you should be looking at a, um, a sort of symbolic representation of your horoscope. These are the 13 zodiac signs, now including Ophicus, if you know anything about that, okay? But traditionally, there were 12 uh, signs of the zodiac. And I know you guys know about this because you're always talking to me about it when I'm out drinking at the bar. You're saying, hey, what's he, Professor Britton, what's your sign, okay? So, uh, and so, you know, Gemini and Cancer. By the way, these are actually real constellations. You know, those, those are, are not just, you know, made up stuff. But there's more than 13 constellations on the sky. Suppose I borrowed a friend here from my bookshelf. This is what I will later define as the, the global sky, or we could also call it the celestial sphere. It's a model of the nighttime sky that we borrowed from Greek astronomers who believed that stars were fixed to a crystalline sphere, which sort of rotated around the earth. Now that might not be true, but it's helpful. Sometimes lies are useful and the celestial sphere is a useful lie. You can only look out in so many directions into space. And that means if you look up or down or left or right or north or south, you're gonna see only so many constellations. Does anyone know how many constellations there are in the nighttime sky by any chance? I wouldn't expect you to, that's sort of why you paid me to, to learn about stuff, but, but I just give you a chance. How many constellations are there in the nighttime sky? A lot, says Mikey, very good. Okay, so uh, <laughs> um, in fact, there turns out uh, to be 88 constellations recognized by the International Astronomical Union, the, uh, the, the body of all astronomy professors who get together and decide things. Let's put this down somewhere where I won't break it. Okay, so let's take some notes. Astronomers are concerned with 88 constellations. Whereas astrologers are concerned with 12, or depending which totem pole you worship, 13 constellations. And if you want to start learning some fancy vocabulary terms, astrologers and astronomers, we refer to these 12 or 13 constellations as Now, uh, I believe it was, my Lord, I would really love to know how to hide the non-video participants. Maybe they don't let you do that anymore. Maybe that's not cool. Uh, it's okay if you, I, I guess it's okay if you want to be a troll, as long as a few of you are going to interface with me, as you, you should have learned in the email. Uh, I'm at work. That's why. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. And honestly, I know it's not practical for everyone to join. Some of you don't have cameras. There could be lots. Some of you might be, I don't know. Right click. So Tyrese, I thought that's how I used to do it, but it's not happening for me. Why is it not happening for me? Right click. Uh, sometimes the administrators uh, take away features. My, my thing is kind of run through CCRI and they frequently decide, ah, they don't need that feature. Why would anyone need a feature? Let's just deactivate it so, so they don't get confused, you know? So unfortunately, I was not expecting that. It's not a big deal. It's just uh, when we go into gallery view, especially for the recordings, it's nice to see people interacting uh, with others. God, that's, oh, here we go. Hi, I found it. Okay, I had to click on your square in gallery view now. Yes, this is wonderful. Okay, sorry about those little bugs, guys. All right, uh, what about, uh, who was it? Was it Caitlin? Caitlin, you defined astrology as a, a pseudoscience. There's a fancy term. Whereas you might consider astronomy to be a 
a physical science, or sometimes we refer to astronomy as a natural science. There is a difference between these two things, but it's probably less important, right? Uh, do you know, Caitlin, what a pseudoscience does, like what, what the meaning of it is? Yeah, so pseudo is a zoological root for fake or, um, and science obviously is a science. So it's a fake science because there's no really evidence to back it up if it's actually true or not, rather than a physical or natural science such as astronomy where you can actually perform experiments, observations about the actual thing and produce results. Yeah, I like I like almost all of that. That was great. Um, usually what we say in the philosophy of science is that science, we're not looking to prove anything true so much as to build sort of a model of nature. Usually what you do is you construct your theories in a way to be falsifiable, but I don't want to get too highfalutin here. Uh, it, one of the big ideas that you sort of touched on is in a science, if you if you make hypotheses or a statement about about the physical world, like what goes up must come down, you then have to back it up with a body of evidence that, that supports your assertions. And what you find out for things like astrology is they use some technical sounding garbly gook as if they were a scientific operation, but the, the, the central premise is not supported by observations and experiments. I'm getting that autofocus issue again, guys. I think this is gonna plague us. For some reason, it just, it goes into focusing really close. And I think it's, it's, it's partly because of contrast, but uh, once again, they changed some features. I don't know how I'm gonna deal with this. It's really gonna drive me absolutely bonkers. Uh, hold on a sec here. All right, okay, we're back. So one of the central premises has to do, uh, of astrology, has to do with the sort of uh, 12 or 13 constellations of the Zodiac. Um, does anyone out there, uh, Caitlin or anyone else, know why astrologers are so obsessed with only 12 out of a total of 88 constellations? What makes Sagittarius and Capricorn so special? Why doesn't anyone say, I'm a Vulpecula or I'm a Camillo Pardalis? Why can't, my, why can't my sign be Orion? What if I identify as an Orion? Are you gonna oppress me in this modern world that we live in? I don't think so, right? Why do, why do you only get to be Capricorn or Sagittarius? Uh, Mikey, it's not because they're the first ones recorded. Um, it has to do with some actual astronomy stuff that I would like to teach you about today so we can incorporate this into our lesson. Let's go back to share screen and let's get into uh, my other PowerPoint where we, where we actually do some work today. And I think it's slide 88, or at least it used to be before I started monkeying around with things. The reason why, uh, nope, it's not slide 88 anymore. Okay, where is it here? Uh, there we go. Let's look at slide 56 together. I don't know how I got that so wrong. Earth orbits the sun in space on a sort of fixed circle, which I will later define as the ecliptic. And here in this slide, you can see the Earth orbiting the sun along the ecliptic path. That's the green circle that traces the orbit of the sun. And as Earth orbits the sun, that, that circle, the ecliptic, it maintains a fixed orientation in space. And what that means is during the course of the year, the sun only appears to drift through a total of 12 or sometimes 13 constellations. And that's why astrologers worship those constellations as special is because the sun is like, you know, if you go back to ancient Mesopotamia or something, the sun is your energy God and it brings you warmth to your crops. So I, I think the idea is if the sun is hanging out and traveling through these 12 constellations, well, then those constellations must be special because that's where Ra is, is headed, right? 
And, and this is how we eventually developed or people developed this concept of astrology. So let's start by writing down the premise because I often find that people who love astrology don't even know what the hell it is they're talking about when they discuss their sun sign. So the central uh, concept uh, behind astrology goes something like this. The location of the sun against the background stars. And here's the kicker that should kind of tell you everything you need to know. The location of the sun against the background stars on your B day, on your birthday, will uh, determine your personality type and or your destiny. The location of the sun as it travels through those constellations of the zodiac, Capricorn, Sagittarius, Taurus, Aries, depending on what your birthday is, that will determine your personality type or your destiny. Um, the difficulty with a statement like this, or rather the not difficulty about a statement like this, is that each, each of these uh, statements refers to something that you can observe in the physical world, right? Um, for instance, the sun is a physical object not only can we see it in our sky, but we've now built machines like the Parker Solar, Plo, uh, Parker Solar Probe, excuse me, that are currently en route to the sun's atmosphere, flying through the atmosphere of the sun and sampling plasma particles. The background stars we can observe with our eyes, with telescopes. Um, your birthday is a matter of historical record. You can look that up in your town hall. Now, personality types are a little squishy because you know, psychologists attempt to measure such things with these personality tests and you're an alpha dog or she's a beta fish or something like that. But, you know, the, the, in the noble science of psychology, people attempt to do these things. And there are some personality types, I suppose. Um, your destiny is pretty clear. You just wait till you die and then you can find out what you did and how important it was for humans. Okay, so it turns out that if you actually go and you check out your birthday, and you compare it to your destiny and, you know, the positions of the sun and the background stars, it turns out that this is a categorically false statement. If you investigate it carefully as a dispassionate observer, there is no relationship between your birthday, the position of the sun, and your personality sign. Sorry, just because you share the same birthday as Albert Einstein, that don't make it Albert Einstein, okay? I know that was a tough one to figure out on your own, okay? But this is what makes astrology a pseudoscience. It's just not true if you investigate it carefully. Um, astronomy, on the other hand, is a physical or natural science, is concerned with making sure whatever statements you make are verifiable and supportable through observations, right? And, and that's why it's, it's a more noble pursuit. Um, so it's the study of all kinds of things, stars, uh, planets, galaxies, gas clouds like nebulae. I like to put the E on the end because it looks extra fancy, okay? Nebulae and then, um, and hell, the universe. That's pretty cool because if, if the purview of our subject is the universe, then that means anything in nature can be studied within the context of astronomy. I guess that means we can study everything and anything we want, right? It's totally free for all this semester. Okay, um, and by the way, that's what you're here to do. Let's take a peek. Uh, let's get out of this slideshow. These slideshows will become available to you guys if necessary. I think they're actually already in. Uh, here's some uh, in the uh, blackboard. Here we go. Uh, slide eight. Anybody know what this picture is? 
this is like some real stuff from nature. This is what's going on out there in the universe. Anyone ever see this picture before? It's kind of like an iconic image. It's called the Horsehead Nebula. So named for this seahorsey shaped cloud of hydrogen gas floating in space. This is what's up with the real universe. It's not even, you know, it's not Zoom and Nintendo and all the rest of it. Most of the universe are giant spheres of radiating plasma and icy cold clouds of hydrogen gas floating in space. Nature is actually quite abstract. And maybe that's something that we should poke around in for a while and, and learn about. Maybe that's why we're here. Anyways, I don't know what you guys plan on learning this semester. I try to keep my uh, expectations low these days, but let's start with this one important fact. Astronomy is not the same thing as astrology. And if you write me an email and you say, dear Professor Britton, I'm in your astrology 1020 class. Well, I'm going to quickly look for my delete key and pretend that you don't exist. All right, I'm not gonna wanna reply to an email like that. So uh, without further ado, welcome to Astronomy 1020. This particular branch uh, uh, of my course deals with stars and galaxies. Our goal is to start out maybe close to home uh, in the solar system, but then quickly get the hell out of it and study stars. We can't do that right away. It's gonna take some time to build up our astronomy muscles. We're gonna to have to do some sort of fundamentals and background stuff, learning little things like the zodiac so we know how to talk to each other. What's the zodiac again? Does anyone know? Who could define the zodiac for me? I'll do it later, but. Kind of tough, huh? Okay. It's one thing to listen to astronomy TV. It's another thing to, to do something with that knowledge, but we'll all figure that out. Okay. So uh, welcome to Astronomy 1020. I am, uh, oh my gosh, this, I must have an old slideshow. This is a much younger me traveling on a motorboat. Uh, come take a ride in my boat through the universe, okay? Uh, I'm Brendan Britton, and I've been, uh, I'm a professor here at CCRI. I've taught this course for many years. And I lo know lots of things about uh, how we can have a good class together. Fundamentally, I'm on your team. I want this to be a fun time. I want it to be easy and enjoyable to learn. You're going to have to trust me, and you're going to have to do the things that I tell you to do so that we don't screw this thing up, OK? Enough about me. Who are you? Uh, well, most of you are new to me. All of you are new to me, actually. Whoever you are, I hope to see you every Tuesday and Thursday with the following two things. The first is a calculator. That's really all you need bare minimum to do this course. And I'm gonna tell you exactly which model I want you to buy. The second is a positive attitude because we're gonna to have to spend quite a bit of time together working on labs and homeworks. I'm gonna sort of help you do a lot of the work that you need to do for this course. All you've gotta do is make the time to hang out with me. And so since you've signed up to do this and even paid to learn about seahorsey shaped clouds of hydrogen gas. I think we should try to have a good workmanlike attitude about it because all classes are a slog and, and this one included, You're, you've got some work to do. We've got some work to do. Um, okay, so with that in mind, uh, what are we here to do? Well, you're here to learn about the universe. And I propose that the universe is a cool place to be and a cool thing to think about, okay? We've got things like stars. Those are in the universe, right? That's what we're here to do. We're gonna learn a lot about stars. We're gonna study the sun. That's our star, the one that we know the most about and the one that we have the coolest high resolution pictures of. Um, at some point, we'll learn a little bit about galaxies. I'll sprinkle that in. You know, this course is supposed to be stars and galaxies, but sometimes it turns out to be just stars with a little, little smattering of galaxies. It'll take a while to get there. Um, maybe I can even talk to you guys about galaxy groups and, and clusters of galaxies. I'll try to sprinkle some of that stuff in there as we go. Um, if you wanna learn about the universe, well, you're gonna have to make a new best friend and that new best friend is math. After all, this is a physical science, right? This isn't like, this isn't like painting 101. You've got to take some measurements, my friends. That's what makes science different than other kinds of disciplines. You need a ruler, you got to take some measurements. 
And once you do that, once you get some numbers floating around, you get a hankering to do some math. Not because you like to torture children, but because you are curious about nature, okay? Because when you look at a beautiful thing like the nucleus of the Andromeda galaxy, you say, oh, dog, that's so cool. I love this picture. I'm so, I'm wicked into that stuff, bro. Okay, well, if you're into that stuff, if you think you like that stuff, you better be into this stuff, okay? You better be able to look at a formula, you know, divide by pi from time to time. You can handle this stuff, okay? Now, I'm not going to expect you to be, you know, the greatest mathematician of all time. You don't have to be Sir Isaac Newton. You have to be a person who owns one of these, a Casio FX260 solar calculator. This is the model that we need for this course, except no substitutions, okay? It can come in gray or there's a version in white, but it's gotta be the Casio FX260 solar. Um, I'm gonna assume now, supposedly this course is at the level of, have you taken algebra one? But I know some of you are not going to be very good at that stuff, slash maybe people haven't even taken algebra before. Okay, fine. I can work with you if you are a reasonable person who can multiply and divide and you have a good attitude about life. Or let's say you can't even do that. Maybe you just have a good attitude about life and you can find your multiply key and you can push it when I say go. I'm going to try to teach you how to punch all the buttons you need to punch. But I can't do that unless we all have the same calculator. I don't care if you'd have calculus three and you're really good. I don't care if you haven't had any math and you're bad. We're all in the same basket here. So you guys will notice that I bring my Casio FX260 solar calculator to class every day. And I hope you do as well. Now, you can run out. You can get it at the bookstore for like 16 bucks. If you go to the CCRI bookstore, you can... Uh, you can get it at Walmart or Staples. Yes, you can get it on Amazon. And I, you guys, did you guys get the email that I sent yesterday? I hope that was helpful in explaining this stuff. I had a link. Yes. I had a link there to uh, to the calculator on uh, Amazon. Uh, sometimes you'll find it for like eight fifty. Sometimes uh, I, I noticed the other day that I think prices have gone up because I saw one for 22 bucks and I was like, what the hell? Oh, key is not operable. Don't, do not, oh, school verse. Don't get that. Get, just get the normal fucking thing, okay? Okay, so look, um, if you buy this on Amazon, you better have prime like instant shipping because you need this today. And I know not everyone's going to have it today, but. I need to train you on this every single day. So do you think we can make a pact to have this by next class at least? Do you think you guys can? Yes. Yeah. All right. It, this is really, I know you might already have one from another course, but it's only eight bucks. Okay. I'd rather you buy the calculator than the book. Now uh, the, we can talk about the books for this course. Um, I, ha I haven't been back to CCRI to get all my little materials. So today is going to be a little bit janky. I think I've got a copy of an earlier version of the book floating around. Here we go. This is, this is an older copy of the book. The book that I'm going to be using for this course is called The Cosmic Perspective. And they have a full version of the text. You can get it like as an e-text or you can rent it. The actual, sometimes they sell half versions of the book. And the version that you want is the one that says stars, galaxies, and cosmology. You do not want the one that says the solar system. That's from my Astronomy 1010 course. But honestly, although the book would be very helpful, especially if you want to augment these lectures, if you take really careful notes of everything we do, you might be able to get through this class without the book. Now, the homeworks are going to come from the book, but I plan on having office hour sessions where we do the homework together. So as long as one person has the book, and I guess that's me, then we can read the questions and work on them together. And that's how I intend for us to do homework, okay? I wanna say that before I lose the thread of this thing. It's important that we do our labs together. It's important that we do our homeworks together so that we do them right. More on that in a bit. Uh, okay, so I'll keep this handy just in case it's necessary. I wish I had the, 
The version that you want is the ninth edition. So it, the cover doesn't look exactly like that. That's an older version. I'll try to have all this stuff uh, here for next time. Okay. Um, before we get into any more astronomy and talk about solar systems and things like that, uh, it might be a good idea. Okay, so everyone knows what calculator they have to buy. You've written that down, correct? The Casio FX260 Solar, very important. Let's talk a little bit about our class. Let's talk about uh, that stuff that you have to do at the beginning of a college course. How is your grade to be determined? What do I expect of you? What's the rhythm of this class going to be like? Um, for starters, why don't we head over and take a peek at Blackboard? Uh, I may have to sign in. Let's see how this works here. Yeah, shoot. Okay, hold on, guys. Uh, opening day uh, jitters here. Uh, I want to see if I can sign in here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I am signed in. Weird. Uh, let's try that again. Share screen. Uh, class, there, I am going to attempt to use the same set of videos for my day class, my night class, and my online class. And I'm sure you can understand the, the value of that. If there are three different sections, it's so much more sane for us to all have the same set of lectures, take the same test, have it really uniform across the board. That's one of the reasons why, especially during these few, first few weeks where we're all online together, I'd like the daytime and nighttime classes to use the same set of videos. Of the people I'm seeing here, are you guys all, are, well, let's see, most of you are probably from the daytime class. Is anyone here for the night class? Can I see some hands? Okay, Caitlin, you're in the nighttime class. Uh, is anyone here from the online version, section 600? I am. Uh, Diana. Oh, hi, Diana. Okay, you're a troll. Hi. Oh, and, and is that Michaela? Michaela's also uh, as well. Okay. So that's great to have a few of you here from the night class and the online class. I know sometimes people prefer distance learning because they like the, the flexibility of the pre-recorded videos. And you're gonna get all of that because these videos will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube every day. But I like to give everyone the option to come in live, uh, especially the nighttime class. However, I don't wanna be repeating this lecture during the day and the night, especially because it'll take up a lot of processing in my computer. So I'm hoping uh, the Tuesdays and the Thursdays during the day will be good for anyone who wants to come live. Um, so let's go over and take a look at the Blackboard. I bet most of you guys are familiar with how to use Blackboard, but someone said this is their first Zoom class. Um, when you log into your uh, Blackboard account using your CCRI uh, login and password, um, you've got this announcements section uh, when you first come in. And I actually like to kind of keep all of the lecture links right in announcements. So it's the first thing you see when you come in. This was a little introduction that's kind of similar to our email. And I actually have versions of this class. All of the lectures are kind of in place. We might have an extra lecture or two because this is the spring semester. But this is a place you, where you can go and see what you missed today. Um, I'm hoping to post each of these classes also into the announcements section so you can see what happened this semester. But this is a great resource if you think you're going to miss a class and you want to pregame it or something. You can use these links here. They all link to my YouTube page where most of these lectures can be found. If you go to YouTube uh, and then you just type my name, Brendan Britton, uh, that should be the first link that you find. Click here. And then the right thing to do is you can click on videos and then it shows you all the different videos. So yes, I have several semesters now worth of these videos. It's quite nice, but each semester can be a little bit different. I might change a homework problem here or there. For the most part, those videos will get the job done if you're in a pinch, but I'm hoping everyone in spring 2022 will, will all watch the same set of lectures. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, most important thing to do when you go to Blackboard is go over to these tabs here, especially the one that says syllabus and schedule. 
And if you haven't done this already, you should probably download these two forms because these are gonna be very important for keeping our class on track. Um, this semester, I'm, tr I'm attempting a new thing here. Let's see how this works. I'm attempting to have all the sections of Astronomy 1020 use the same uh, syllabus and the same schedule. So here's the schedule. I think I opened these before class started actually. Oh, there we go. And here's the syllabus. Now, why is the syllabus helpful? You've got my name, you've got my email. This is my cell phone number. Send me a text, give me a call. I don't care. I'll talk to you guys at any time of the day or night. You just might have to put up with some level of inebriation, depending on what hour you call at, okay? But I, I, I feel calls and texts from people all day long, and I'm, I don't care. You just hit me up anytime. I'm chill about it. Uh, uh, this is what I'm proposing will be the live lecture times for all sections, if you're interested in coming live. If you cannot attend live, you will watch these videos later on as if they were live, okay? Um, and um, what we're gonna be doing is on Tuesdays, we have an hour and a half lecture on Zoom. And then on Tuesdays after the lecture, we do a lab, which I'm gonna try to keep to about an hour. Usually I'll have a setup here in my apartment. We'll have some lenses, we'll build a telescope or something. That's where you earn some points in this class. On Thursdays, it's the same format, but First, we have a lecture, and then after the lecture, instead of a lab session, we're going to have office hours. Office hours is where we do our homework. Now, you can complain about this if you want, but the reality is you've got, two, you've got to do some homework, right? So you do the homework by yourself, in which case it's going to take you hours, and you're going to get it wrong and piss me off. Or we can all do the homework together and get it 100% right and boost our grades you'll quickly discover that doing the homework together is the only sane way to approach this. So plan on doing that with me on Thursdays, okay? So we have, uh, each of my lectures are based on a weekly thing, doing one chapter a week. So what's gonna happen is we do the first half of our lecture on Tuesday, and then we do a lab. On Thursday, we do the second half of our lecture, and then we do our homework. And what's really cool about that system is it means that all of your lab will get done on Tuesday, all of your homework will get done on Thursday and you won't have to take anything else back with you. You won't have to worry about getting other stuff done. It'll all be in the camera. You're can. setting us up to pass. <laughs> that's pretty much what you're doing. Yeah, that's right. I'm basically doing it for you. Now, the, the midterm and the final, we're only going to have two tests if this goes according to plan. That is going to be on you. But if you just attend the, the lecture and write everything down, if you do the homework with me and you do the lab with me, not only will it will it keep you from failing, even if you do terrible on the test, the, the lab and the midterm grades will support you. But honestly, you'll probably know a little bit about what to do on the on the exam because you've been training with me this whole time. Uh, that's why it's very important that you write down what I'm writing down. And when I do an exercise in the calculator, I want all of you sitting there punching the buttons with me. OK, that turns out to be really important. So. Let's go over this again, uh, sort of uh, using my PowerPoint slides here. So what I'm trying to say is uh, F528, you don't really earn any points for coming to lecture. That's where you listen to me and you learn about astronomy and you get some training. I'll try to make it as fun as I can. Um, the points that you earn first on Tuesdays from doing your lab, and lab is worth one quarter of your grade. So every lab that you turn in is based out of 10 points. If you do it with me and you do everything that I tell you to do, you'll probably get your 10 points. So that'll be a nice, great way to keep your grade high. Um, homework is also worth a quarter of your grade. And like I said, on Thursdays after lecture, we'll do our homework together. Homework consists of five problems from the text, from the end of chapter problems, that we do together and sometimes they can be pretty mathematical. So uh, for instance, uh, let's take a look at your homework tab and your lab tab. Um, labs can be found under the lab tab. You'll notice that, uh, oh, sorry guys, black, as we all know, anyone who's been doing this for a year knows Blackboard sucks. 
and it frequently glitches out and then you have to start over again. There we go. Let's try to go to the lab tab. Okay, our, our first lab that we're actually gonna do today is on powers of 10 and measurements. And usually the way this works is you take this PDF and you download it. Weird. Okay. Um, and you, you print out, I think we're just gonna need the first sheet for today. In fact, I should do that right now. I'm gonna print out mine because we're gonna be working on this together. I'm not gonna, well, I'll print out all three pages, but I think we're just gonna end up doing the first one. We'll see how this goes. So I'm gonna hit print. I like to print the paper version to write on it. And then you take a photo and you submit it to Blackboard. Some of you may not have an active working printer. In that case, you're gonna to have to get creative in one of two ways. You either have to kind of take this PDF and find some kind of PDF editor to, to sort of type onto it or something, and that works. Another option is hardcore style. You get a piece of notebook paper, you rewrite all of these problems down by hand, and then you solve them by hand. That's also acceptable. I just need to be able to see the, the, the problems that were assigned and then what your answers are. Basically, you're gonna make it look like mine. Um, I wanna make an important announcement right now because I know there's gonna be students out there that just fucking love to type stuff up in Microsoft Word. This course is gonna involve some math and you've gotta make your math look like my math, okay? And that means that it is not acceptable for you guys to turn in an assignment that looks like this. Let me show you what I cannot stand. So let's go to a new page and let's say we're gonna do some math together and you start doing two times 10 to the power of five equals. That is bullshit and that's unacceptable. I will not accept your math that way. If you insist on typing everything up because that's so important to you, then you need to do it right and you need to use an equation editor. If you don't know what an equation editor is, you probably shouldn't be typing up your homework, okay? But you go insert, you do it right. You insert equation, and then you use all the proper symbols. Two times, ooh, here's a script thing. Two times 10 to the power of five. If your math looks like this, then we're cool, all right? But if your math looks like this, we are not cool. And if you don't know the difference, then I think you should just write the math parts by hand, all right? And then you should take a picture with your phone and submit it. So for those of you who are new, if you don't know what you're doing, please just do it all by hand in your notebook and then take a picture. Uh, for those of you who once again are new, I have to constantly remember that some of you haven't done this before. Usually when you, when you wanna submit your assignment at the end of lab, I think you click on this, lab one, powers of 10, and there's a place for students to submit it, okay? You, you don't write submission, never choose that. You, you take a picture, you browse local files and you upload that picture so that I can read it. You should see a little preview box. Make sure that you can see your thing and that it's not sideways. You know, do it right for God's sakes. Make sure I can read your thing. Um, sometimes people think they've made the submission but Blackboard gets hung up, just like you saw it get hung up a second ago. And sometimes people's submissions don't finalize. That's very bad for you because I only grade the things that come into my little needs grading box. So make sure that your submission actually went through. We can talk more about that later. I think actually what I like to do is on the first day, everyone who's here with me live, I have you guys all attempt to submit and then we check to make sure everyone's came through. That'll take about five or 10 minutes of annoyance, but it'll be a great way to make sure that everyone's doing it right. Do you understand? So we'll be doing that at the end of lab. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, forgive me if I'm telling you guys stuff that you already know. I, I really don't know what you guys know, what you don't know. Uh, for the homeworks that we'll do on Thursday, and I really need you to have your calculators, notice that we're gonna be doing five problems uh, two problems from the back of chapter one and two problems from the back of chapter two. I even made little scans of the homework questions. Damn it. I don't know why it's doing that. So we can read the homework questions together right from the book. So again, having the book would be really helpful for extra reading. But who are you guys kidding? You're not going to read the fucking book. Nobody does that. Not anymore anyways. I mean, you should. You're supposed to read books and stuff. But I know you're not going to. Oh, look, Caitlin's got hers. Awesome. 
Um, if you don't have the book, if you're poor, if you don't care, fine. Just get the calculator. That's all I need you to do, okay? 10 bucks, you can swing this. And I'll take care of the rest. You just show up and hang out with me. Okay, um, thank God I am not an art teacher, okay? I'm not gonna have to look at your crappy little sculpture at the end of the damn semester and be like, uh, B minus or whatever. Like, I'm not making this shit up. It's science, baby. I tell you how to, you know, what the point system is in Monopoly, and you're gonna move around the fucking board and you're gonna put some points into homework and some points into lab and some points into midterm and final. And then I'm gonna hit the, the algorithm on my computer and then your grade pops out, right? Your grade is determined by you and how many assignments you turn in. Usually the way this works is if you show up to all the lectures, if you do all the labs and do the homeworks, then you are 100% guaranteed to pass. The people who get into danger are people who flake and who, who don't turn in labs and who don't turn in homeworks. Since these sessions are gonna be recording, if your arm gets chewed off by an alligator and you can't make it to class someday, you can still take your other arm and you can watch the video later and you can try to write down your homework and submit it, okay? So, so there's no reason to not get all of this work done, whether or not you're here with me live. Uh, does that all sort of make sense? Do you guys have any questions before we proceed? Let's see how I'm doing on time, probably bad. It's 12.30, oh, I'm doing very bad, okay. We've got enough time for a half an hour of real lecture. Any questions? Uh, let me check the chat log here because I haven't been paying attention. Where is the homework again, says Fred. Um, uh, the homework again. Okay, uh, Fred, if you're still with me, uh, to get to the homework, go to Blackboard, log in, find our class, and then you can see HW, a little homework tab on the left, click that, and not only is that where you can see the PDFs, but then you click on this and then you submit down here. Usually, I don't want you to choose write submission. I want you to browse local files and I want you to take a picture with your cell phone of the lab and then submit it. Okay, I can show you how to do your first one because we're gonna do a lab today at, uh, at one o'clock, right? in a half an hour. I better get going. I better teach you something. Okay. So uh, now that you guys know how the, uh, the, the class works, presumably, let's get into talking about astronomy. I can't believe how long I took doing that. Um, I have little slideshows. By the way, these slideshows that you see should be under PowerPoint slides if you need them. Um, some of them need to be a little updated because I change them all the time, but uh, you get the basic gist of it. I also have a set of lecture notes. These are crappy little Roman numeral outlines of what we're going to talk about all day. I don't even know if you absolutely need these, but they come in handy for formulas and stuff. I just downloaded one here. You guys just had lecture zero on introduction to astronomy 1020. And these are some things that I, I should have talked about. Okay. Um, now we're going to go into our first lecture, lecture one which we'll cover today and Thursday's class as well. Uh, and like I said, you can find that under lecture notes, uh, numbers in the nighttime sky. I don't know if these are helpful or not. They're not extensive notes. They're just a crappy Roman numeral outline, uh, but they do have some handy things where if you occasionally need some of your conversion factors and things that I'll be talking about, I, I have them written down there. Okay, so we'll keep those handy. And uh, we will begin with our first lecture. The, the, set of our, the purposes of our first lecture, lecture one, are to sort of help you understand how the nighttime sky works, but also how to deal with numbers. Astronomy deals with very large numbers of stars and atoms and things like that. So we have to have a way to talk to each other about numbers and how, how we do little bits of pigeon math together. Um, it's also about learning some basic vocabulary terms, things like the zodiac and an astronomical unit. These are vocab terms that'll help us have an intelligent conversation together, okay? Um, so let's just start off by reminding you that you live on planet Earth, and that is one of eight planets in the solar system. The solar system, if you didn't know this, consists of the sun, which is our star, eight planets which orbit around that star, 
And then we also now have some dwarf planets or some minor planets. Pluto, Eris, and Ceres in the asteroid belt are considered dwarf planets or minor planets. Um, there are also some other things. There are asteroids, which are located between Mars and Jupiter. And there are cometary objects, which are outside the orbit of Neptune. Plutos and Eris are kind of like those cometary objects. And there's a little bit of dust. That's basically the solar system. If you left the solar system and you zoomed out from there, where would you be? What is outside the solar system? You all know what's outside the solar system? Milky Way. That's right. And what is the Milky Way, Fred? I have no idea. Uh, other solar systems. That's right. But it's, it's more than just other stars and solar systems. Um, the Milky Way could be considered to be uh, other stars. Hold on. Sorry. I'm trying to change the window size here. I don't know if this is going to show up in the recording or not. Um, the Milky Way consists of a, a big disk, an assemblage of other stars and their planets. So all those other solar systems. But a galaxy, Fred, like the Milky Way, also contains a great quantity of gas. So it's not just other solar systems, but gas is a big part of galaxies. And with time, I will eventually teach you about that interstellar gas. You know, a really nice way to see what a galaxy looks like uh, from the edge on is to look at a beautiful picture of a galaxy. This is a real photograph that I'm about to show you of say the Sombrero Galaxy. And the Sombrero Galaxy is a beautiful uh, galaxy that you can see through a telescope. And it's an example of an edge on spiral galaxy. Look how cool this thing looks. That is a real photograph, guys. That's not some artist with a paintbrush. This is a real photograph. And what you can see is, while the galaxy contains many, many stars, the stars are what are giving you the little bits of fuzzy light that you see, you can also see that the disk of the galaxy contains a great quantity of gas. And the, the mass of that gas is comparable to the mass of all the stars and solar systems within it. So galaxies are a different kind of a structure, a different beast than, than a solar system, but they're, they're much bigger and they contain solar systems. Um, let's start by considering uh, our sister galaxy. So one of the issues with living in the Milky Way galaxy is because we are inside the Milky Way galaxy and because it is so big, we actually don't have a good picture of our galaxy because that would require us to be able to fly out of it and travel millions of light years away and then look back and, and, and sort of take a photo of it. We, don't, we haven't figured out how to do that yet. That's a little bit too daunting for us. But we can look at other galaxies, and probably one of the best ones to look at is our sister galaxy. One of the closest galaxies to us is the and Andromeda galaxy. So it's a great placeholder for the Milky Way. And here's a real life uh, optical photograph. Ooh, this is a high resolution doodad here uh, of what Andromeda looks like. Notice this isn't quite seen edge on, it's seen at an angle so that you can kind of see the gas and the dust that's in the disk, but you can also see that there are a zillion, well, there's a lot of stars in there. And that's one of the first lessons that I'd like us to consider. Since we have to talk about big numbers in this class, oh, here we go, we got focus issues, guys. I'm gonna figure that out before next class, I promise. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, so, does the gas disk determine the borders of a galaxy? Uh, uh, that's a complicated question. <sighs> Hold on, guys. I'm sorry. I can't take notes. And this fucking autofocus is going to drive me insane. I had figured out a solution, and then they changed the damn game. They're always changing the game on me. Oh, it's all grayed out now. Uh, I'm going to figure this out. Mm. it's for some reason it wants to focus really it can't figure whoever designed this algorithm this is going up on youtube if you're the engineer who designed the autofocus you suck you suck as a human being and i hate you because you make my life bad every day you did it wrong i wish you would just turn the fucking thing off and resigned because that would have been better for all of us so 
that's a PSA to you, all right? So, okay, here we go. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, so uh, whoever asked, was that Fred who asked that question? Yeah, it was me. Uh, Fred, that's such a cool question because uh, before scientists knew about dark matter, then what you said might have been correct. Where you can see the light, that's where the matter is. Uh, so one of the tricky things, Fred, is that you can usually see stars when you take a photograph of a galaxy because stars emit light. The gas, on the other hand, and the dust are kind of invisible. You can see some of it if they block starlight, but there's a huge amount of gas that just cannot be seen either with the naked eye or even at any other wavelength of observation. Well, that's not true. Certain radio telescopes can look at cold hydrogen gas, but now we know that galaxies contain a tremendous quantity of invisible dark matter. We can detect its gravitational influence, but we, we can't see this stuff and we actually don't know what it is. It's an outstanding problem in astronomy. And so uh, many people uh, uh, have figured out that, that the, the dark matter is not just in a disk, but it sort of surrounds the galaxy in a sphere. It's a spherical distribution. And, and so no, the, the edges of that galaxy are not necessarily the edge of the mass of the ga galaxy. It's one of the outstanding confounding problems that we have in galaxy astronomy. Uh, yeah, Lionel. Uh, I got a question. I heard that dark uh, matter, or I think it was like dark energy, it causes like our universe to like expand like rapidly. Yeah. And they call it like a getaway universe type of thing. Yeah, yeah, an accelerating universe. So. Um, Lionel, that is correct, but I want you to be careful here. It turns out that dark matter is one thing, and dark, dark energy. energy is another yes, thing. Another thing. Yeah, I, was I could understand why it's so easy to confuse those things. Now, it, it may be that they are related in some ways because they're both sort of connected to gravity, but, but the relationship between them is not obvious, and they are two different observational problems. Dark right. matter is an observational problem where we know that the gravity of a galaxy is much more powerful than the amount of light that we can see from stars. So for instance, let's say a galaxy had 10 stars. You add up the mass of those 10 stars and you should know the mass of the galaxy, right? But instead yeah. we find out the mass of the galaxy is like 100 stars, even though we only see 10. And then we say, okay, there's some dark matter there that we haven't seen yet. Uh, the dark energy has to do with the, the expansion of the universe. Expansion. And both of those are in a way connected to gravity. So Lionel, they may actually have a connection, but for now, as far as we understand it, dark matter is one thing, dark energy is another. Okay. We go talk about both. But first you guys need to be able to do big numbers with me, okay? So let's do gotcha. some, a little more quotidian. <laughs> um, let's start by talking, uh, our first lesson that you're gonna learn is on scientific notation. I know some of you might have done this before, but bear with me. This is a skill that everyone needs to have to do this course, okay? Scientific notation is how we do big numbers, okay? For lack of a better way to say this. Hopefully you guys can read this. Please let me know if you're having trouble with my notes. Let's start by considering the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That's not something I would expect you to know. That's why you took this course. The number of stars is one trillion, approximately. It's actually a little less than this, but we're gonna cheat and I'm gonna lie to you and tell you it's about a trillion stars, okay? Um, turns out lies are helpful sometimes. Okay, anyways, uh, does anyone know how big a trillion is? Like how many zeros are in a trillion? I don't know if this is it 30, isn't it? 30? No, no, that's a that's like a quintillion or something. There are okay. names for all kinds of crazy big numbers, and we'll learn some of them as we go along. Uh, Lionel, I can't see all your fingers. How many? Uh, nine of them. That's a billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A trillion. So is, we have three more of them. It's going to be 12. That's right. So this is why we have to do this uh, starting out. So let's write that down. So one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 stars. I want you guys to write the number down like that. And if the decimal point is hidden, but it's technically over here, remember that we like to put commas uh, after every three zeros, unless you're like British and weird, and then you might use periods instead. But you know, we don't want to be like British people. They're weird. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> um, Americans use commas after zeros, right? That's how we do America. All right. So um, this is tens, uh, sorry, ones, tens, and hundreds place. These are thousands, millions, billions, one trillion. Okay. You guys got that? So hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. There are 12 zeros in a trillion, but let's imagine writing this down. If you think about it, the number of digits is actually 13 because you've got 12 zeros, but the one is a 13th digit. Now I want you guys to take a look at the Casio calculator that I expect you all to have. Let's type in some numbers here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's it. The Casio calculator has room for only 10 digits. Now you might say, well, that calculator sucks. Get a better calculator. Oh, no, 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 no. This is the best calculator that money can buy. It's the best calculator on planet Earth. It's powered by the sun. The batteries will never die and has all the buttons we're going to need in an easy to locate spot. All right. You cannot, however, type 1 trillion into a Casio calculator. And that means if we're going to use numbers of this size every single day, we need scientific notation as a method of writing down big numbers. And it turns out that we can do this using those good old powers of 10 from mathematics, right? So when you say 10 to the power of 1, that basically means 1 10. Or you can think of it as 10 with a multiplied by 1 in the, in the corner there. OK. 10 squared is 10 times 10. You all should know that's 100, right? 10 to the power of 3 is 3 tens multiplied by each other. That's what the power means, is how many of those tens are we multiply. 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. And if you start to notice a pattern here, when you raise 10 to some power, like 10 to the power of 4, that basically just means a 1 with four zeros after it. So for instance, 10 to the power of five is 100,000, a one with five zeros after it. We're gonna use these powers of 10 to smush this number down into a more compact form, okay? Um, however, to do that, I might need to use some vocab terms. Uh, I didn't, I kind of wrote this sloppily on the side here. I'm going to erase this in one second, but do you guys want to go ahead and, and write all this down? Meanwhile, uh, 10 to the power of zero, what's that? It's zero. False. It's not. It's one. It's one. See, people tend to think that zero is the default number in algebra because zero is the default number in your bank account. But, but in algebra, one is the default number. See. If 10 to the power of one is 10 times one, 10 to the power of zero is no tens, but it's always a one left behind, never a zero. Zeros actually are kind of weird. This is a really important rule that I need you guys to remember this, okay? 10 to the power of zero, anything raised to the power of zero is always one. These are things that you learn as a rule to start, but then they end up making good sense later on, okay? Uh, class, I would like to erase this little bit over here. Do I have permission to do that or Emma, how you doing? Does anyone object to me erasing this little bit over here? Okay, thank you. I promise I'll get smoother at this. Uh, I was back in person and, and now I'm back online again. I'm sure you guys have felt the, the yin yang yo-yo effect as well, okay? so. All right, a um, couple of quick definitions here. The first number in your number, we call that the lead digit, okay? The lead digit is the first number as long as it's not zero. The lead digit must be one through nine, not zero is allowed, okay? So lead digit is the first number in your number. Then there's this part. 
So you can think of this as the number of zeros, okay? But another way to say number of zeros, um, you could call it sort of the power of 10. But if you want, if you want to learn a real fancy term today, when fancy people talk about big numbers, they don't call it the number of zeros or the power of 10. They call it the order of magnitude, okay? This is a fancy term, order of magnitude. You're gonna hear me use that from time to time. So I'm training you now. The order of magnitude means how big is your number in terms of tens, hundreds, or thousands, right? For instance, if I were to talk about the order of magnitude of my bank account, maybe I would say it's of order thousands. But in the past, my bank account was of order hundreds and sometimes even of order one or zero. <laughs> um, then at times, uh, I'm hoping someday in the future, when I finally get rich off the stars, maybe my bank account could be order of magnitude tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions. That would be fun. Okay. But probably not. All right. I'm probably just going to scrape by like the rest of you. All right. So anyways, the last part of this number that's important is this. This is the unit and units are of extreme importance in our astronomy class. Anytime you write down a number, you're going to write the units down along with it because the units tell you what it is you're measuring and they help keep your brain straight and they help keep my brain straight. Every number in your homework will have units with it. That's very important. Okay, now that we've got some terms straight, let's put a number into scientific notation by smushing the zeros or the powers of 10 into the powers of 10 that I had over there on the side, okay? So uh, I think I need a little board space. Maybe I'll go up here. Okay, so I'm gonna start by writing down the lead digit, very simple. Now we have 12 zeros, so that's just times 10 to the power of 12. And then I'm gonna write down my unit, one times 10 to the 12 stars. That is how we say 1 trillion stars in astronomy. It looks like it's a math problem, but I don't want you to think about it like that. Even though there's a times symbol, one times 10 to the 12 is just how you say one trillion in our class, okay? Now, to help with this, there's gonna be a very important button on our calculator, okay? So when we use the Casio, we can write this or type this into our calculator using the EXP key. And we would type it one EXP 12. That's how you do it. Okay. Um, that means that EXP key, it stands for times 10 to what power? Okay. So the times 10 is all built into your EXP key. I want you guys to watch me do it. I kid you not. All right. Come on, autofocus. Uh, let's clear it out. I would type that number into my calculator, and you're going to see me do that during lab. 1 exp 12, just like so. Now, it looks like 1 to the power of 12 there. That's because they don't have room to put in the times 10. You must put in the times 10. You will never, ever write something like that on your, uh, sorry, I'm working on my focus. Never write that down on your paper, okay? You have to put the times 10 back in if you understand what I'm saying. So let's, let's make that very explicit here. Okay, um, when, what you will see on your calculator is you will see this. And when you see a number up there, that means it's scientific notation mode. It's up to you when you write this down or God forbid you type it, that you put the times 10 back in. Does everyone understand? You're obligated to do that. One of the reasons why is if you were to write this down, mathematically, I speak math, right? And I can, once you speak a language, you cannot unspeak it. So that means one times 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 one times. 
out of 12 of those ones. And that's of course one, and one is not 1 trillion, right? So you can't write this down and think that I'm gonna understand that it's that. That's gonna confuse the crapola out of me. You must write the times 10 back in. Remember, it's EXP, it's not EXP times 10. The purpose of the lab that we're about to do is to sort of train you on that. Okay, um, we're gonna quickly run out of time here because I've been naughty today. But let's try a couple more examples of scientific notation. Uh, and then I'm going to make a little chart for you. And then we'll take a little pause before our, our lab. Students, uh, can I erase this? Does anyone object? I try to ask because I know some people are slow note takers here. All right. Okay. Let's try a more random example. Let's see if you had a number that looks like this, 9876543210. Uh, do you guys know how to say that number? How would I say that number? So want to try it? Um, it would be nine trillion. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. This is uh, three, six, nine. Oh, sorry. So it would be nine billion, yep. um, 876 million, 543,210. Right. It took a minute though. Yeah. I would have had to think yeah. about that too. Okay. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to recognize our lead digit is nine, right? And, and nine is a valid lead digit because it's not zero. Oh, sorry, I'm having autofocus issues. Fucking A. This is going to drive me absolutely nuts. If I, uh, is it me? What's, oh, I feel so helpless and I don't like that feeling. I got to figure this out. Like I said, I used to be able to go into this Logitech settings and, uh, they changed the game on me. What do I do? What do I do? If I can't use the control panel, can I? Oh, uh, advanced. Ah, oh, there's just nothing. There's nothing me to do here. Come on. Um, I need to, I need to like make a light sort. Let me try turning up the light. Maybe it's having trouble with this contrast. Ah, oh, so much time wasted on this. Uh, I definitely have to get this figured out today. Uh, what do I do here? Do I? Oh, I got an idea. I'm going to deactivate my camera. Oh, wait. Okay. I'm going to go to my settings. Uh, okay, that didn't work. Hold on, guys. Now I'm going to go to the settings. Huh. I should be able to connect to my camera now. There we go. I'm going to turn off autofocus. Okay. Then I'm going to deactivate this and I'm going to reactivate. I don't know if this is going to help guys, but I'm desperate. We'll see. All right. It seems to have worked, right? I think I might've found a workaround for now. Okay. Thanks, Mikey. All right. We've got a lead digit. Then we have uh, the rest of these numbers and we're going to treat these numbers as if they were zeros. So what we're going to do is we're going to write our lead digit down 
and we're going to put a decimal point after it. And for now, we're going to keep some of these numbers as change, as like leftover digits, right? So I don't know to keep the zero, but I'll do 9.8765432.1. Then I'll put in my times 10. Now, to figure out what the power is, well, all we have to do is just count how many times the decimal place moved. So for instance, if the decimal place used to be here, you guys will notice that I've now slid it all the way over to being in between the nine and the eight. And then we count how many times it hopped. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 9.87654321 times 10 to the nine. This is how we would put that number into scientific notation. Now, most of you could think about complaining here and say, well, this number actually looks worse than that one. What's the value of this? You're, you're missing the point. This is how we put the number into scientific notation. The reason why it will end up becoming more elegant is in astronomy, we usually do not want to keep all of those digits. We usually need to round the number down. Now, in a few moments, when I do our first lab on powers of 10, I'm going to talk to you guys about measurement and rounding. That's part of the lab today. But for now, let's say this. If you're ever in doubt about how many digits to round to, always round to two digits. Keep the lead digit and keep one number after it, OK? Now, when you cut a number and you try to round it here, the rule that you follow is if the number that you're about to chop off, if it's five or more, then, then you, you increment the eight, right? But if the number is four through zero, then you, you just leave it flat, okay? So since we're gonna cut the number between the eight and the seven, since seven is above the number five, we would round this to 9.9 .9 times 10 to the nine. That's probably how it's gonna end up looking at our homework. I will teach you guys the proper art of rounding in a few moments when we do our first lab. This is such an important skill that I'm dedicating lab one to it because if you're not conversant with going back and forth into numbers and scientific notation, you and I are gonna have a hard time talking to each other going forward, all right? So um, let me erase, and before we end class, uh, we're gonna make one table. Sorry I'm going over, but I had a lot of hiccups and hijinks today, and I, I do apologize for that. It wasn't a very smooth uh, operation today. Before we end, let's do a little table on some common powers of 10. Uh, by the way, a great idea for this class, while you're out buying your Casio FX260 solar calculator, Get yourself like a 50 cent plastic ruler like this, especially it needs to have metric stuff on it, okay? Very helpful. And if you're feeling, you know, if you're feeling like a high roller, maybe buy yourself a little $8 compass. That's gonna come in handy too. Or, or maybe a tracing circle maker, something like that. Things to make circles are gonna be really useful in this class, but bare minimum, if you could get the calculator and get yourself a ruler, it'll be helpful for making tables. Um, I have a ruler here that I'm going to use. Meter stick, okay? Common uh, powers of 10. A little table with three columns. Uh, a column for the name, the power of 10, and the metric prefix. And we're going to do trillions, billions, millions, and thousands to start. Later on, we'll expand off this, but this is a good place to start. So we'll have uh, a trillion a billion. You'll notice that uh, uh, we had a few screw ups on that today. I don't remember who was with me back then. Was it Emma or some uh, Emma? Someone had uh, an issue with that. Okay, trillion, billion, million, and thousand. 
All right. So uh, trillion is 12 zeros, 10 to the power of 12. A billion is nine zeros, 10 to the power of nine. A million is six zeros. And as most of you know, a thousand is 10 to the power of three. These things are the same in my mind, and I want to get them the same in your mind. Every power of 10 has a metric prefix associated with it. For instance, thousands can be represented by the metric prefix kilo, right? So for instance, one of the common conversion factors, if this here is a meter, this is a meter stick, right? Uh, one kilometer, one kilometer is a thousand meters. And, and I could, instead of writing that as a thousand meters, I could even write it this way. I could write uh, one kilometer is 10 to the three meters. That's two totally different ways of, of writing this. Sorry, that's two equivalent ways of writing the same thing. Do you guys know the metric prefixes for millions or billions or trillions? If thousand is kilo, sorry, Fred. Oh. A million is mega, like a megabyte is a, a million bytes, right? A billion is a giga, that's a gigabyte. And then uh, a trillion is a tera, that's a terabyte. Those will come in handy from time to time. Okay. Um, at this point, I'd say we have concluded uh, lecture zero and the first part of lecture one. We didn't do a ton today. We just kind of got through scientific notation, but that's usually how it goes. Um, we are going to transition to lab. I'm going to pause for just a second. Uh, everyone, it would have been great if you had these calculators today, but I know you don't. So we're just going to muscle through it as best we can. Um, by next class, you promise to have this, correct? so that we can start training on it? Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. Um, uh, we're a little behind, it's 1.06. I'm gonna try to end at one o'clock for all of our lectures. Do you guys wanna take a little five minute pause just today? Sometimes I'll give you a five or 10 minute pause to get some iced tea or something. That'll let me transition my computer over to the lab desk, all right? And then we'll, we'll try to crank out our lab. Does that sound good? All right, so- I'll leave it on. I'm sorry, leave it on the same um, Zoom. Yeah, let's all stay logged in. I'm gonna pause the recording. I'm just gonna take five minutes to move my computer over to the lab area, organize my papers. And then after I have a quick uh, glass of iced tea, then we'll, we'll get into it. So just about, just a quick five minute interlude. Does that sound right? Okay. Uh, meanwhile, during that five minute interlude, either print out those pages of the lab or if you don't have a printer, I want you to just take the first page, page one, and write out all of those questions. Can you do that for me? Okay. All right, so I'll be back in five minutes. I'm gonna pause the recording so I don't have dead air. See you in a moment. Okay, Astronomy 1020, welcome back. We're about to do lab one, powers of 10. And uh, to answer your question, Lionel, um, the place we get this worksheet is we go into Blackboard under our class, there's the lab tab. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're doing this lab, lab one, powers of 10. Okay. Okay, sounds good. I want you to see how it says lab one, powers of 10 PDF. You can right click, open in a new tab. And then I recommend the simplest method is just to print, just to print this, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, but you can also try to write onto here if you're careful and submit it digitally. But I'll show you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to use my phone as a remote camera. Uh, hopefully, I don't get too many embarrassing text messages. I got I meant to turn all that stuff off, but you guys are going to see some things probably. Uh, all right, so let me turn on my Wi-Fi and uh, notification. Can I just turn off all notifications? That would be awesome. Let's especially turn off message notifications and 
Instagram and Facebook. Not that I have anything that much to hide, but you guys don't want to see the boring details in my life. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's see how we're going to do this here. What I like to do during the lab sessions, today we're not going to have too much uh, high tech stuff, just like a ruler and me in a, in a paper, but I'm going to go to uh, share screen and I'm going to go to my iPhone. And then let's see how this works here. Okay, so uh, go to iPhone and then I, oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed because I used to do this every day and uh, uh, turn on sharing, screen mirroring. Okay, and there's Zoom, it's connecting. Yes. Okay. And now I can go to camera mode. All right. And uh, we can see, notice I've got my calculator here. I've got my worksheet. Okay. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to address the question that Emma asked in a moment, but let me show you guys how we're going to set this thing up. Okay. So um, first things first, could you all please do your labs in pencil in the future? I don't know if you have a pencil handy, but when you're out buying your calculator, buy yourself a 50 cent Dixon Ticonderoga. And uh, that's because when we make mistakes, if you start scratching stuff out, it looks really horrible and it can become pro prohibitively difficult to follow you with scratch outs. So I really prefer you being able to erase. First thing I want you to do is at the top of the page, I want you to put your name. Okay, so I'll put mine written. And then I want you to put your section. So everyone in this class is going to put AS 1020. But depending on what section you're in, if you're in the daytime class, you're 001. If you're in the nighttime class, you are 102. And if you're in the online class, you're section 600. By the way, this is really important. Every time that you write me an email or send me a text. I need you to say, hi, I'm Fred. I'm in Astronomy 1020 section 001 because I have three sections of you guys and I have like another three sections of Astronomy 1010. That means close to a hundred students and it's really, really hard to figure out who is what. And oftentimes the answer to your question depends upon what class you're in, right? So you guys aren't thinking about teacher specific stuff that I have to go through. Please write your, tell me your name, tell me your class and your section every time. By the way, it's a really good idea for us to write somewhere in the lab. This is lab number one. That makes sure that, see the issue I just had with Lionel where he thought this was lab six? This way, when we submit, you know that you're submitting to lab one. So can I ask of you guys that you do that every time? Is that okay? All right. Now, uh, before we proceed any further, let's take a moment to address another question. Today's lab is just going to require that worksheet, a pencil. It's nice if you have a ruler. The calculator would be helpful, but I know it's the first day and not everyone has one. Um, we had a question during a little break from Emma. Emma, hold up your calculator. Emma says, I know math and I want to use my TI-80 Bazooka 2000 calculator. Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing, Emma, you can, I can't stop you. You can use it if you want, but I don't want to have to be giving a separate set of instructions for you yeah. versus the class. So the first question I would ask is, do you know where your fourth root key is on that calculator? Yeah. Okay then you can probably do this, okay? Okay. And I can help you a little bit, but if everyone has a different calculator, this is gonna wicked suck. The smart thing is for everyone to use the Casio FX260. Another thing, Emma, that you're gonna miss out on is, I love it when students with some math background, maybe like engineering or science students take this class, because I think I have something to offer you types as well, as well as a non-science student. But I would love to teach you the pleasures of the Casio FX260 because sometimes, you know, the thing that you have is like a stinger missile. And if you've got to take down a jet. No, isn't it great? 
Right. But on, sometimes you just want to shoot a cowboy, you know, and shooting a cowboy with a stinger missile is not useful. It's not helpful. Or, I mean, you can do it, but it's vulgar. <laughs> sometimes you want your little pea shooter, your little six shooter. You want to pull it out. Pew, pew, pew. And one of my engineering students uh, loved this thing. He went on to Worcester Polytech as like an aerospace engineer. He's like, these other dingbats were sitting there in their T-85 and I was just punching circles around their ass. That's how I'd, I'd like to teach you about that. So Emma, consider the pleasures of the <laughs> FX260, okay? Eight bucks. I'll think about it. Think about it, all right? You might be surprised how much you love it. All right. So now that I've said that, if you must use that calculator, if you know what you're doing and you know where a, a good litmus test is if you know how to take a fourth route. If you know how to take a fourth route, you could probably use your calculator and be fine. If you do, yeah, not sponsored, exactly. Uh, if you don't, please use the Casio. It'll make things, if everyone has a different calculator, this is gonna suck for everyone who watches these videos, okay? All right, um, let's get down to business today. The, the first lab that we're doing here has a se several different parts. Um, and although we're gonna use that worksheet as a template, um, I kind of go off roading a lot and I wanna do some talking today as part of this lab. There are three sheets that are a part of this lab and people are always asking, do I have to do the other worksheets? No, you only have to do what we do. We're definitely gonna do page one today. If there's time, I might have us do table one. I may not, we'll see how this lab goes. You only have to do the stuff that we do here during lab and I might have us do some additional stuff as well. Always follow along with the lab and the homework. Always do it together, never on your own. Um, the first part of today's lab is just kind of making sure that we can master our EXP key um, and also making sure that we can sort of just put numbers into scientific notation. Today, we're going to multiply numbers that are some in scientific notation, and all of our answers we're going to put into scientific notation as quickly as possible. I'll deal with rounding as a separate issue. And then I want to talk to you guys about measurement and that stuff as well. Okay, so we'll do these in several different parts. Um, if you don't have a Casio calculator and you're going to use a bastard calculator like the one that M is using, fine. Um, instead of your EXP key, some calculators have it. Uh, where's my, I have a TI-85 here somewhere. Yeah, here. Just so you know that I'm part of the brotherhood and sisterhood, Emma. I also have a TI-85, okay? And on some calculators like this, here I go doing the thing that I said I wouldn't do. Instead of an EXP key, they have a double E key. That's the equivalent of your scientific notation key. Never, ever, ever type times 10 or you will fail. You will fail this class and you will fail as a human being, okay? You use your double E key, or more preferably, you use the EXP key. That's your scientific notation key. That's what we're here to train on today, okay? Let's see if we can get back to my iPhone and let's, let's start doing some work. Okay. So, um, uh, sorry, stop share. Share to iPhone. Let's make sure this still works. There's Zoom. It's a lot better than it used to be, but it's still glitchy sometimes. All right, that's cool. Can everyone see my paper okay? Yeah? Okay, cool. So let's take a look at our first problem. <clears throat> like I said, we're gonna get our answers into scientific notation. Our job is to multiply 2.0 times 2.8 times 10 to the five. And so, I don't want us to follow the instructions. I want us to just practice with the EXP key. So the way that I would type this in is I would go 2.0. Uh, wait, I've got, I got some glare issues. Let me see if I can fix that. All right, excuse, let me try that again. Excuse me, Professor, if we don't have this calculator, what do we do right now? Um, you just kind of watch and write down what I write down. It's pretty lame, Fred, but that's why it's so important that you get it in the future. Believe it or not, Fred, the act of pushing the buttons yourself helps you learn. And so this will be a sucky experience today, but in the future you'll have it and you'll punch, okay? It's fine, Fred, this, sure. whole, this whole thing is imperfect. We know that. We're doing the best we can, right? We still want to learn. We don't want the universe to stop because of COVID. Okay, so um, we're gonna do 2.0 times 2.8 uh, times 10 to the five. 
So first I do 2.0 times, and now I'm gonna use the EXP key whenever there's a times 10. 2.8, I don't do times 10, I do EXP five, and then I'm ready to compute the answer, so I hit equals. Now, if you're following along, this is the answer, 560,000. But for today's operation, I wanna quickly put the final answer into scientific notation, all right? So what's my lead digit, Fred? Five. Right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna write down the lead digit. We're gonna put a decimal point after it. Um, let's keep the six as part of the change. And then we're gonna do uh, times 10. And now we have to figure out our power. Fred, I'm just picking on you for fun to make this interactive. Sure. Uh, let me get my high tech uh, cell phone holder, okay. Um, do you know how, uh, how, to, how to get the power of 10 there? Uh, you count the number of z uh, <clears throat> places from the decimal point? To, to, where your, to where your decimal point ended up, which is between the five and yeah. the six. Uh, if you hold the thing still, I can't hard. Hold Sorry. that still. One, two, three, four, five. That's right. So it's 5.6 times 10 to the five. That is another way to say 560,000. And then when we're done, let's box our answer because that's kind of a classy move. That's what physics and astronomy students do. That tells the reader that this is your final answer. I don't want to see any intermediate steps. Your shit should look like my shit. By the way, on homeworks, that's not gonna be the case. I'm gonna to wanna to see some work for the homeworks, but I'll show that to you later. For now, just kind of follow along with me. Okay, let's bang out another one. We're gonna do 5.6 times 6.725 times 10 to, ooh, negative six. Maybe we ought to take a pause and we ought to talk about negative powers of 10. Okay, so how did I used to do this here? I had the tape, okay. Let me go over to some scrap paper here. You can write this down or not, I don't care. Question, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is all gonna be uploaded onto the Blackboard later on, correct? That's right. And we'll do that together as part of the recording so that everyone watching later can see exactly how to do that. I know that some of you might find this a new experience, but what we're gonna do at the end, uh, I'm sorry, whoever said that, we're gonna take a photo of this worksheet and we're just gonna upload that to, uh, to Blackboard and we'll do it together so everyone can see how that works. Sound good? Yeah, okay, let's say it sounds good. Now, I'm gonna do some work on my scrap paper here. You do not have to include this as part of your lab, but if you wanna jot it down for your own sake, that's great. Let's talk about uh, negative powers of 10. Okay, okay, suppose you forgot what this means, 10 to the minus one. That means one over 10 to the power of one, okay? Whenever you have a negative power, it's not a negative number, it means you flip it over the fraction bar. And that basically means one tenth. And if you write one tenth as a decimal, it's 0 0.1. That's the tenths place right there, okay? And then if you do 10 to the power of minus two, that's one over 10 squared, all right? Sorry about my handwriting. Uh, or one over 100, and that's 0 0.01. And what you're gonna start to notice is every time you raise 10 to a negative power, you're gonna move the decimal point over to the left one more time. So 10 to the negative three, that's basically 1,000th, right? It's one over 1,000. And 1,000th as a decimal is 0 0.001. When I think of 10 to the minus three, I think of that means you put the one at the third place after the decimal point, right? So if I wanna quickly do 10 to the minus four, I do 0 0.123, and then the one goes at the fourth place. Everyone following me so far? Okay, um, when we do uh, negative powers in our calculator, you do not use the minus sign, but we're gonna use the negative key, which on the Casio calculator is the plus minus key above the seven. Some calculators like this TI-85, look at all that dust. That's how much this means to me, Emma. See that dust? That's the dust of neglect and misuse. This guy is shiny and fresh. I use it all the time. Okay, so just once again, another pitch for the Casio. Um, 
some of these calculators have it down here, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at our, our number here. And if I'm going slow, it's because I don't want to lose you bastards, okay? So be grateful because I won't always go slow. All right, we're going to multiply 5.6 times 6.725, and we're going to do EXP negative 6. Whoa. Okay, sorry. My tape cam here. Um, and I'm trying to hold it steady, Fred. Just I'll get better at this, okay? It's I'm a little rusty in the saddle. Okay, so we're going to do, uh, sorry, 5.6. times 6.725 and then I'm going to do exp negative negative key six equals I need to turn off my screen lock because it's bugging me all right so do you see that number there guys we're obviously not going to write that down on our paper why what do we need to do to this number to make it good who followed me today? Um, Sorry? You need to, you need to, you need to go ahead, Lionel. Oh no, never mind. <laughs> it's okay. Well, who else was talking then? Anyone? Talk to me. I, I was I, I was saying you need to round. Um, the rounding, let's not worry about that right now. Can we do rounding later, Emma? Yes, we are gonna want to round, but that's a separate issue. Right now, I just want to make sure that you can fucking translate from calculator onto the paper, right? So What's my other point, Lionel? Uh, you need to turn it into like a scientific notation. Well, this is calculator scientific notation, but I need to turn it into the kind of scientific notation that looks like this. In other words, the point that I'm trying to make is you have to put the times. The times 10. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. So if I've got 3.766, let's not worry about rounding just yet. And then we're gonna do times 10 to the minus five. I promise my technique here for, for these Zoom classes is gonna get better. I'm just, like I said, I'm a little rusty here. Uh, let's see, if I go into my settings, uh, where are my settings? I should be able to turn off my screen lock. Uh, I'll regret that later, but for now, that's that's how it is. Okay. All right. Okay, I'll try to speed this up here. Are we cool, guys? Do you all see that? You have that? Okay. Our I do next... have a question. Yeah, go for it, Fred. Um, on that last equation, why didn't you do the the math inside the parentheses first? Because that misses the whole damn point. We that's thinking like slow, like when you took your math one class. Um, Fred, I want it to be obvious to you that that's a num I that's not a math problem, Fred. That is a single number. Like if I told you my name was Bob, you wouldn't try to multiply B times O times B. <laughs> you would just accept that I am Bob, correct? correct? Well, that's how I want you to think about this. It's not a math problem. This is a number. And that number, 6.725 times 10 to the minus six, what that means to me to be perfectly honest, is that means zero point, um, so it's 6.725 at the negative six place. So one, two, three, four, five zeros. The sixth zero is a six, and then there's seven, two, five. You see what I mean? 10 to the minus one, two, three, four, five, six. That that number just means that to me. I don't need what? to I don't need to what? do math. That's not the math, Fred. The Why is it a parentheses then? Oh, oh, because the people who made this are batshit nuts and they put parentheses in all kinds of stupid places. Just forget okay. about it. Sorry. I think what they were trying to do is show you that this is in scientific notation and that's not. But unfortunately, not helpful here. We're just not going to worry about any of that. We're going off-roading, Fred. We're doing it our own astronomy 1020 way. I know not all of you have the calculator, so this is kind of awkward, but it's about practicing with the EXP key, Fred. That's what this is about. All right? If, by the way, if we were all in person, I would have a box of these floating around and I'd let you borrow one. Guess what? Life didn't work like that this time. Okay, sorry. Can we go pick one up from your office? Sorry? 
I'm sorry, someone asked me a question, but I need you to help. What, what was it? Oh, no, I was just kidding around because you said you might have a box first. So I said, can we go pick one up at your office? Yeah, <laughs> you could. Uh, but I don't know if they'd even let you in the building. So also, I'd need it back. Why don't you just go buy one at Staples, okay? Or at the bookstore. Okay. So um, let's try this next one, Fred. Here comes a whopper. Remember, we're going to punch that in as a number, and then we're going to times that as a number, okay? Every time you see times 10, we're going to replace it with EXP. Anyone who types times 10 is a loser. You've got no place in this class, all right? So let's do this right. So we got 3.77, 3.77, and then we're going to do EXP5, uh, EXP5 times... Notice how it put that right into the number version for me, 4.8 EXP3, and now we just hit equals, boom. So there's our answer. So, hey, Vincent, you wanna party for a second? Should we talk about this? You wanna to talk to me, Vincent? Why not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's try to, uh, be brave. I know it sucks to be on the spot, but can you help me put that number in a scientific notation? Let's focus, what's your lead digit? One. Okay, so let's start with the one. Now we're not gonna worry about rounding just yet. Put a decimal point. What do you wanna keep after that? Um, maybe the 8096. Sure, that sounds fine for now. Uh, later on, we'll talk about rounding. I want that to be a separate issue. Um, 8096. Now, of course, Vincent, we need our times 10. And if I try to hold it steady again, do you think you can get the power of 10 by counting how many times? Uh, is it times 10 to the fifth? To the uh, no, because although you did write down the six, you've actually moved the decimal place to oh, between nice. one and the eight. So you got to keep moving until you get to the one and the eight, between the oh, one and the eight. nine. That's right. So it's, let me just show how Winston got that for everyone. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, Emma, if you know how to do this stuff, don't worry. We're going to go faster eventually, but right now we're starting slow. Okay, we got to get everyone on the same page here. That's how we're going to put that 1.896. Right, cool. So everyone write this down. All right, now let's just kind of go faster. Let's do another one. 5.29 EXP3 times 6.8 EXP minus 7. So 5.29. Sorry. I'm... Let me try that again here. 5.29 EXP3 times... 6.8 exp negative key 7 equals. Okay, so you can see they've already put it into scientific notation mode. Anytime your calculator shows a number up here, that means you are in scientific notation. So we'll just write it down 3.5972, no rounding yet. Times 10 to the negative 3. Always got to put that uh, times 10 back in. The EXP button is fun and easy to use. Let's try our next one, 2B. 9.65 EXP3 over 2.0. Always catching glare here. Uh, 9.65 EXP3 divided by 2.0 equals. Okay, uh, gotta put that in a scientific notation. Uh, Josh Dean, are you down to, to chat me here? Yeah. All right, help me put that in a scientific notation like a big boy. Um, I would do 4.8 times uh, 10 to the second. Careful. If you're putting the decimal place between the four and the eight, as you should, then notice that you've actually moved one, two, three places. Mm -hmm. Okay, so learning le lesson there. So it's, um, if you wanna round it, that's fine. Times 10 to the third, right, buddy? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Wrong answers are helpful too. Okay, now let's do this next one. So 5.6 EXP5 divided by 1.6 uh, EXP5. I'm so awkward at this. It used to be so good. 
So uh, 5.6, exp5 divided by 1.6 exp5 equals okay now that is the correct answer but today we're trying to put all of our answers into proper form of scientific and what i mean by proper form is you've got like a lead digit right and then you carry some change whatever it is that's that's what I would call proper form. Even the number 3.5 can be put into scientific notation. Does anyone know how? Caitlin, you want to try? I could be wrong, but wouldn't it be 3.5 times 10 to the first power? Um, unfortunately, no. And here's why. If you did 3.5 times 10 to the 1, 10 to the 1 is 10, right, Caitlin? Mm -hmm. And 3.5 times 10, that would be 35. But we don't have 35. We have three. Well, you would move it over. You would move over the decimal point one. No, no, no. That's not okay either. Because this is not good form of scientific notation. Because your lead digit cannot be zero. So that's not considered cool. That's uncool. What if we tried it in a different way? Caitlin, what's our lead digit? It's three. And we already have a decimal point after that. So let's just write it down. So let's just do 3.5. We know there's a times 10. And now the right thing to do, Caitlin, is to ask, how many times did I move the decimal place? You didn't move it. It's, well, it's so, one, technically. No, one means you move it one time. Oh, we didn't move it then. So what would my power be? It'd just be 10, right? No, uh, hold on. Let's get something straight. If you write times 10, that is the same as 10 to the 1. Remember, uh, the default number in algebra is 1, not 0, right? So you'd have the same problem. 10, 10 to the 1 would give you 35. You moved it how many times? I think I saw Fred mouth. Oh, it'd be 0. That's right, because 10 to the power of 0 is 1, right? 1, yep. Now that might seem weird, but that's the right way to write 3.5. Remember that 10 to the power of zero is one. We talked about that earlier, correct? All right, let's do the next one. 3.2 EXP9 over 2.4 EXP5. So uh, 3.2 EXP9 divide by 2.4 EXP5. Holy moly, what are we going to do here? Why don't you do one, yep. two, two? You would move the decimal point to right after the one because your one would be your leading point. And then you would do three with a line up the top of three. Oh, repeating. gosh. Look, yeah. I know that's what they taught you in math class, right? Three yeah. forever, right? That's fine if you're a mathematician and you don't have any real work to do. But science, my friends, is concerned with the art of measurement. And this is going to lead us to a much bigger issue. For now, Caitlin, let's just leave one three there. If we don't know what to do, round to two figures. Let's put in our 10. And what would my power be? Can you at least give me the power? Hold on, let me count. So one, two, three, five, six, seven. Wouldn't it be nine? No. You no. made a very important mistake. It's four. I, Is it four? Yeah. It's four because you would move it four. You started there. You don't count from back here. You count from where the decimal place is, right? So yeah. you moved it one, two, three, four places. Yeah, it'd be four. My bad. That's okay. That's why we're we're doing training. It actually is more helpful for people to see those common mistakes. So you're you're doing me a favor in a way. Okay, for now, let's leave it at that and let's put D on pause. This is gonna enter into another part of our lab where we kind of talk about some cool stuff that I'm interested in, okay? The question that we're trying to address is how many threes are really necessary? And Emma, that's related to your discussion about rounding that, that you touched on, okay? Part of today's lab is practicing with scientific notation 
part of today's lab is can you handle using the exp key okay but part of today's lab is to talk about the art of measurement and to talk about precision and to talk about how many threes are necessary and things like that okay now in a science class like like astronomy we're going to be using the metric system of units right so the metric system of units is based entirely off this guy. Let me go to speaker view here for the recording. And uh, you know, a meter is kind of like a yard, but better, okay? Uh, a person is approximately two meters tall. So you'll notice that if I put the meter stick on the ground, it goes up to about belt height on me. That's a good reference for a meter. It's about the height of your belt from the ground. Um, and the meter contains within it smaller subdivisions. Um, okay, so my autofocus isn't working the wrong way now. All of these little ticks that you see here are, are these big ones are centimeters and the little ones are millimeters. Why don't we try to go back over to my iPhone for a second? Because I want to talk to you guys about the art of measurement in the metric system. So if you can bear with me, I know this is a little awkward. Share to iPhone again. Uh, come on, baby. It takes a minute to connect, so I know this, this dead air is always bad for TV. Come on. Sometimes you just kind of lose it. Fudge. I think I'm losing it here. What if I, if I do it like this? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm failing. So I had a lot of tabs open. Let me try this one more time. Love of God, please work. I'm having uh, opening day jitters here. Usually it's, oh, hey, Emma. Meanwhile, let's talk about your little pooch there. Like, look at that cutie. What's that guy's name? Uh, her name's Princess. Is Prince, you know, my dog's name growing up was Princess too. Is that an Italian greyhound? No, she's part Chihuahua, part Dachshund. Well, we want to see more of Princess. That sticks uh, up in one ear that flops down. Uh, yeah, Princess is cute as hell. We want a whole lot more of that guy. Um, okay. He wants to learn astronomy. So. Yeah. You bark at the moon. Um, all right, what do I do here? I think I have to, like, I have to turn my phone off. So sorry about this, guys. Um, now I turn it back on. Uh, I just got like a new, oh, okay, here we go. I'm I have like a newer iPhone now, like a, I went from the iPhone 5 to an iPhone 12 and it was like, oh my God, I might just like, I couldn't even operate the thing anymore. Um, and I realized that I used to I used to use this older iPhone. I might switch back to this one actually because this is probably totally dead too. All right, like I said, guys, I'm gonna get smoother at this. I'm just I'm a little not smooth today. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. My whole operation here is predicated on this phone being able to talk to, to you. So uh, what am I gonna do? Am I connected to Wi-Fi? Yes. I think maybe it was just the Wi-Fi connection was taking a minute. Uh, there we go. Okay. 
Jeez, Louise. All right, fucking A. That was obnoxious. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. Here we are. All right, so let's take a look at uh, at this this wonderful little um, ruler that I have here. So let's go over to the metric side. You guys can see that there's a centimeter. Uh, a rule of thumb that I have for centimeters is you'll notice that a centimeter is about the width of your pinky fingernail. That's a pretty reasonable estimate of a centimeter, okay? So um, a centimeter is about yay big. Um, that's a metric unit. A centimeter is one hundredth of a meter, okay? Um, we can also use these small little tick marks there. Those are millimeters. And you guys can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And what that means to me is that one centimeter contains 10 millimeters. When we take a measurement in a science setting, one often has to consider what's called the precision of the measurement or what a machinist might call the tolerance. And that means what is the quality of your measurement? How careful did you take that measurement? Oftentimes, I will specify the tolerance of a measurement in this class. And oftentimes, I'll want you to measure to the nearest millimeter, which is also the same thing as a tenth of a centimeter. So sometimes I can write things like this. One millimeter is equal to a tenth of a centimeter. If I specify a precision or a tolerance in measurement of a tenth of a centimeter, oftentimes people will write the, the tolerance like this, where plus or minus a tenth of a centimeter means the dude or dudette who took the measurement took the time to measure to the nearest little black tick mark. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's always a couple of ways to do something. If you were going to measure the width of this tape, you could kind of do it all sloppy and be like, oh, yeah, it's about uh, 10 centimeters. Or you could do a really careful job where you carefully line up the zero with the edge of the tape. And then you look carefully at the edge. Let's see if I can get that in focus. Sorry, contrast is a bitch here. OK, so maybe I shouldn't have chosen this clear tape as, as my best thing here. Focus. Come on. Um, I think it's getting beguiled by the clear tape. Let's try. I'm measuring the width of this black tape roll. You guys will notice if I take a measurement to the nearest tenth of a centimeter, can you see how we're not quite at 14, but we're roughly one tick beforehand? That's measuring to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. We have to talk about this stuff, believe it or not. This is not obvious shit. Okay. Anytime you take a measurement, and by the way, every number that you will ever encounter in your life, whether it's the number of pennies in your bank account, the number of teeth in your head, or whatever, every number is ultimately a measurement. And science, my friends, including astronomy, is all about the art of measurement. That's what this shit is all about. That's what makes science different than other disciplines, is we measure things and we report our measurements as faithfully as we can, okay? Let's say I were to take a measurement of myself. It might be helpful to have a two meter stick here. Uh, I think, one sec, guys. Well, shucks. Uh, I think I, I brought, either I did something funny with the other meter sticks, or I, I, uh, I, I brought them back to CCRI and I forgot to bring them back here. To take a measurement of yourself, you can either sort of carefully use your meter stick or you could use a two meter stick. I'm just realizing for the first time, I thought I had extra meter sticks around, but I don't. Let's, let's pretend like I took my measurement. This is really turning out to be a little lamer than I wanted here. Normally, I, I kind of do a demonstration here. Uh, okay, let's see if we can get this back. 
I probably shouldn't deactivate the the phone connection. Okay, thank God. Okay. Um, in the past, I've measured myself with a two meter stick and you might get something like this, 187.6 centimeters. Every time you write a number down, you are inherently telling other people about how carefully your measurement was done. For instance, if I were to record this number, uh, you know, like on a stone tablet and I buried it in the desert somewhere, future archeologists could dig that tablet up. And if they figured out that I was measuring the height of a person, they would notice, look at this dude here. He took the time to measure himself to the nearest 10th of a centimeter. He did a good workmanlike job and he took the measurement to the nearest little black tick mark that his meter stick had. That's pretty cool. And in other words, this, this number tells you how tall I am to within a one millimeter precision. And you know, for instance, that I'm not 187.5. That's the sort of quality that I'm telling you about. Um, one way to look at this is to say that this number has four significant figures because every number in the number is telling you some information about how tall I am. If I'm over 100 centimeters, then I'm taller than a munchkin, right? And uh, if, I'm, if I'm 180 centimeters, then I'm almost two meters, but not quite. 187 means I'm just shy of, uh, of 1.9 meters. And then the 0.6 means that I took the time to count from 187 to 187.6. And, and that's something about the quality of my measurement. So we could say that this number has what we would call four sig figs. That's one way to talk about precision. All the digits are significant. Um, another way to talk about this number, a physicist way, which is kind of cool, is to say that this number has a precision of one part in a thousand. And that's because um, if you measure to a dime out of a hundred bucks, that's the same level of quality of measuring to the nearest dollar out of a thousand bucks. In other words, this measurement could be divided into a thousand parts and you measured to the nearest part. That's a weird way of thinking about things, but it's how scientists often talk to each other, a one part in a thousand precision. Anyways, for now, we're gonna focus on sig figs. Sig, not all numbers are significant, right? For instance, if I were to tell the class, I have $1,000 in my bank account. Suppose my bank account said 999.76. Now you wouldn't say upon seeing my bank statement, wow, you're such a fucking liar. You said you, said you had a thousand bucks, but you only have 999. You would understand that I was giving you a kind of rounded off loosey goosey measurement, right? One does not always require one, two, three, four, five significant figures when you talk to people. You say, I've got about a thousand bucks in my bank account. I'm in trouble. I need a job. Okay. Um, on the other hand, uh, so this number would have one significant figure. That's a one sig fig kind of uh, estimate. If I tell you I have $1,100 in my bank account, this number has two sig figs because I'm telling you the accuracy of or the precision of my bank account down to the nearest hundred dollars. So I didn't tell you how many dollars and cents I had, but I told you $1,100. That's got two sig figs. If I tell you I have $1,110, well, gee whiz, this number has three significant figures. And that's because I'm telling you how much money I have down to the nearest $10 bill. Do you see how this game is played? Okay, hold on, let me... Uh, Sharp. Note to self, find that later. Sharp pencils, sharp minds, here we go. All right, so uh, now you guys try. Suppose I tell you that I have $1,001 in my bank account. Can you guys guess how many significant figures that is? Four? Yeah, very good. Fred, in this case, the zeros are significant. 
And the reason why is because I'm giving you a one part in a thousand precision estimate. I'm telling you how much dollars I have to the nearest dollar out of a thousand. That number has four significant figures. Now, sometimes zeros are significant, right? And sometimes they are not significant. And understanding the difference is kind of important in a science class. Um, to help you understand this, perhaps we could consult the official tome that physicists uh, you know, obey, the Bevington and Robinson data analysis. I didn't think about this until right now, but I might have that somewhere. Data reduction and error analysis for the physical science. I don't know what you nerds have on your bookshelf, but I bet you don't have that one. Okay, so this, this is the official book that, that you know, I was trained on. It's nice to sort of share my library with you guys. That's one of the fun things about this pandemic. And they talk a little bit about uh, the chapters for the pros start the same way that our chapters do. They start talking about accuracy versus precision, right? This data is accurate, but not precise. This data is precise, but not accurate. Precision is about reproducibility. And they do a little thing on significant figures and rounding. And I want to sort of check this out here. So if you have a number like, like 1001, they say the leftmost non-zero digit is the most significant digit. That's our lead digit. They say, uh, if there's no decimal point, the rightmost non-zero digit is the least significant digit. So that would be our one, that's our least significant digit. They say, if there is a decimal point, the rightmost digit is the least significant, even if it is a zero. We'll talk about that in a moment. All digits between the lead digit and the least significant digit are significant. And then they give you a wonderful little example here. They say, for example, the following numbers each have four significant digits. One, two, three, four is four sig figs, but so is 123,400, that's four sig figs. 123.4 is four sig figs. Oh, look, they used my number. 1,001 is four sig figs. 1,000 with a decimal point is four sig figs because of the decimal point. Um, but look at this one over here. 0 0.0001010, those four digits are significant digits but these are not. So this number has four sig figs. Also the number 100.0 has four sig figs. To be honest, this sig fig shit, as you see, can get kind of confusing. In general, in our class, when we're in doubt, we're gonna round to two digits of significance. But this one time I'm trying to teach you how to do it, okay? Now, what's cool about scientific notation is that scientific notation will strip away the bullshit numbers, the not significant digits, and it tends to only keep the significant figures behind. For instance, suppose we consider the number 1,100. Can you guys remind the class how I would put that into scientific notation? What would that be? One point one times 10 to the third. That's right. 1.1 times 10 to the one, two, three, times 10 to the third. Now, do you see Emma and friends, how that got rid of the, the non-significant figures naturally, and it only kept the sig figs? For this reason, when professional scientists talk to each other, when they like report an answer in a paper, they always put all of their results in scientific notation so that other scientists will have no confusion about how much precision the measurement had. Suppose they discover that the answer to life, the universe and everything is two, okay? They, or actually, what was it from Douglas Adams? Uh, it's uh, 42. 42. Yeah, from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. A, a professional scientists or astronomers, if they discovered the answer to life, the universe and everything was 42, they wouldn't report that as 42 they would report it as 4.2 times 10 to the one because they would want to leave no confusion with fellow scientists about how many significant figures were there, right? So once a number is in scientific notation, you know that however many digits you have there, those are all the sig figs. Let's return now to our 
part 2C, which is a long-winded way of me getting about to talking about rounding, okay? Let's look at our top number here. How many sig figs does the top number have? Two. two. So the three is significant and the two is significant. That part is sacred. You don't mess with that. How many sig figs does the bottom number have? Not a trick question, guys. Two. Two. So how many do I get to keep in my answer? Two. Same, they call this in computer science, garbage in equals garbage out. The precision of your output is limited by the crappiest number in your input. If this has two sig figs and that has two sig figs, you can keep two sig figs. And what that means is if I type in 3.2 EXP9, and I divide it by 2.4 EXP5, I don't give a shit if your calculator spits out a bunch of threes. Those threes aren't real. They're fake, they're bullshit. And if you write them down, you're a nincompoop who doesn't know anything about measurement, okay? You are obligated to chop all those off. In fact, if I were to get around this to two significant figures without scientific notation, because rounding is like a separate issue, I would round that as 13,000 because that's 1.3 times 10 to the four, right? That's rounding to two sig figs. In our class, when you are in doubt about what to do, round to two sig figs, because most astronomy is a low precision science, okay? All right, let's try one more time. And then how am I doing on time here? I wanna check my clock. I'm at 2.10. You're supposed to have two hours for lab. I try to keep it to an hour because I know you guys get tired. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna do this one page and then we'll have a few minutes of talking about how to submit because it's the first day. But let's do one last problem together. We're gonna do 2.99792 times 10 to the eight divided by 5.520 times 10 to the minus seven. And we're gonna round this son of a bitch proper the way a professional who had read data reduction and error analysis for the physical scientist would, like a goddamn scientist. Okay, so let's do it. Let's go 2.99. 792 exp8 divide by 5.520 exp negative seven pow we see a whole bunch of shit there and now we got to figure out what is real what are the real numbers and where are the fake numbers okay uh what should i do class how should I turn this into that? How many sig figs are on the top? Two. No, nine, no, no, no. One, oh. two, three, four, five, six sig figs on the top. Try again, Fred, how many are on the bottom? Uh, three. False. Remember that if there is a decimal point, the zeros are significant if they're at the end. That was one thing they told us in Bevington and Robinson, okay? That's so in four. fact, Fred, we tricked you good twice, didn't we? This has one, two, three, four, five, six sig figs. This has one, two, three, four sig figs. How many do I get to keep in my final output? Four. Okay, so I accidentally erased it with my thumb here, but let me just put it back in 5.520 exp negative seven. All right. So what should I round this to? Five point four three one zero. No, not zero. Four, this is a significant figure, your lead digit. Four sig figs is the five, the four, the three, and the one stop. What about this shit? You didn't forget about that stuff, did you? That's your power of 10, bro, and that is sacred. You don't ever mess with your power of 10. So someone tell me what to write, goddammit. It is, it's gonna be 5.431 times 10 to the 14th power. Beautiful. And that's how you do it like a pro, like a professional. Bam. Let's go back and check some of our other numbers and see how we did. Um, these numbers both have two sig figs, two sig figs. That's cool. Um, this has three sig figs and that has two sig figs. Did we do it right? 
Yeah. Yeah, because you always keep the crappiest number of sig figs. So two is correct, Emma. Okay, let's go up here. How many sig figs? Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting shitty focus issues. Hold on a sec. I'm going to try to, I got to steady this so that my delirium tremens don't mess up the screen. Okay, so uh, how many sig figs? Three. How many sig figs? Two. So what should we have kept? 3.5. Uh, are you rounding bad, Caitlin? Are you being a bad rounder on the job? That's not three point. You, if you chop the, fuck. If, if you chop the number there, you is 59 cents closer to 50 oh, cents or 60 cents? It'd be 3.6 times 10 to the negative third power. That's how you round like a damned pro. That's what our final answer should have been. So let's, all right, I told you not to do this, but now we're doing it. Let's cross that out. Okay. Um, how about up here? How many sig figs in 1C? Three. Here? Two. What should I have rounded it to? 1.8. Times 10 to the nine. How do I say that in plain English? How do I say that number? 1.8 times 10 to the ninth power. Or you say 1.8 billion. Because I told you all during lecture that 10 yeah. to the 9 is billion. That's 1.8 billion. Okay, fine. Okay, how about up here? Two sig figs, four sig figs. How many do I keep? Two. Two? And so what do you round that to? 0.8. Sorry? 3.8. But you have to include the power because that's sacred. Yeah, times 10 to the, um, what was it, negative fifth power? Yeah. And then up here, we got two and two and two, so that's cool. Do you guys see how when, when you're in doubt about what to do, most of the time two sig figs is the right way to go? That's how we're going to do things. Now, listen, we're going to have a rule in this class, and I want you guys to remember this. We have to talk about this at the beginning of next lecture. From now on, there's a rule in this class, and the rule goes like this. Any number that is greater than 1 million or 10 to the power of 6 must be in scientific notation, okay? I'm gonna make that a hard and fast rule. Any number greater than 10 to the power of six must be in. So in other words, I'm cool with you guys writing 999,999, but as soon as you cross over to 1 million, I wanna see one times 10 to the six. Cool beans? All right, now look, because it took a while, opening day jitters and all, this here, this is going to be your first lab, 10 out of 10 points that you turn in. I wanna make sure that you've got all your proper answers down. So you guys got all this stuff? Okay, don't forget your name, your section in lab one. Now, what we do now is you can try it together, take a photograph of this page, click, and then let's see if we can upload it uh, to Blackboard together, okay? So uh, we'll be ending soon. I know you're probably kicked here. So once you take a picture, um, sometimes doing this from your phone can lead to troubles. It usually works better if you do it from your computer. Go to lab tab, go to lab one, powers of 10. By the way, some people have figured out how to upload like a PDF. PDFs work really well, but so do JPEGs and stuff. So you browse your local files, you click the picture wherever it is and you upload it. So I think before we end class, we should all try to go and look at, I want you guys to see what I see on my side of the page. So that's gonna help you guys figure out what to do. So when I go to grade for you guys, I go to my grade center, okay? And then I have a section called needs grading. No one has submitted anything yet. Can you guys do that for me? Can you guys submit this assignment? You only need to do the first page. Don't worry about page two and three. We didn't get to it. That's fine. Uh, the whole time I did my assignment in my notebook, if you don't mind. That's, oh, wait, who's talking to me right now? Uh, Lionel. Lionel, I think it's great that you did your, your whole assignment in your notebook. 
what you can do is just take a picture of the assignment in your notebook and submit that. Right, Maya. Same thing with you. Honestly, that's the way I would do it. If I was doing this class as a student, I would put all of my lecture notes and I would put all of my uh, homeworks and labs in the damn notebook. And then I would just take a picture and submit the picture each time. That would be like the wicked simplest way to do this. But remember, some of the labs are gonna get more complicated. So you might wanna try to print out these pages so you don't have to, uh, yeah, I'm heading. I'm gonna head down to like a local library and print them all out for the semester. Yeah, it's only a few pages, and don't forget, you might want to print the questions too. That could be helpful. So what I mean is, the labs that that, that you have here, these these things. Uh, shit, Blackboard's doing its thing again. Uh, what are you guys? You're ten twenty zero zero one. Um. The lab, the labs have like a PDF usually with them that you might want. Um, but but for the homeworks, if you can spend the extra dimes, you might want to print out the questions for the homeworks, which we'll be doing starting on uh, Thursday. Okay. Okay, sounds great. Hey, um, let's talk about a couple of things while I'm waiting for you guys to upload. Each week, we have a lecture in a lab on Tuesday, then we have a lecture and a homework on Thursday. I want you guys turning in your lab and your homework by say Friday or Saturday at the latest. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grade everybody for the week, daytime, nighttime, and online. I'm grading you guys on Sunday. And then I want to put that behind us and move on to the next week. I don't want you sons of bitches trying to submit everything to me at the last day of class. I will kill you. All right. I will zero you out. Do you understand? So this is important because if you're watching later in the night class, if you're if you're doing this online at random hours of the day and night, I need you to get one lab and one homework done per week. Can we all try to make that promise? Something really crazy happens. You get COVID, you're intubated. We'll try to work something out. But for the most part, I want everyone turning in one homework and one lab per week. That's your benchmark. And I'll do it with you. You just got to hang out with me. Awesome. Okay. So did anyone submit? I want to see if I can, I just want to see how people's things are looking and I want to see if it's acceptable or not. Uh, sorry, I got to go to needs grading. Oh, awesome. You guys have been busy. So let's check out uh, people's uh, submissions and see how they're looking. By the way, sometimes um, people if, who, if it doesn't complete, it'll end up as like, in progress, I bet we probably have one person who's in progress here. Make sure that your actual thing is completed, not in progress. Because if you're in progress, I won't be able to, this sometimes says in progress, I won't see you in my needs grading and I'll miss you. All right, let's see how people's submissions are looking. If you don't mind, this will be helpful for, for students watching later on, okay? So, okay, it's blue, but Josh, I can see it and I can work with that, okay? I'll probably give you a 10 out of 10 for that. I do wish you had rounded this. Did you see how I rounded those two? Josh got lazy. He didn't finish the fucking job. I don't know, Josh. Maybe maybe I'll take off a point because I'm feeling irritable today. I don't know why you wouldn't do every single thing that I did. That was probably a mistake. Maybe consider you know submitting that again with the little corrections I made. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Oh, thank you very much, Emma, for giving me a sideways assignment. I love grading like this. Maybe you could figure that out. Hit the rotate button or something, okay? Check yourself before you rotate yourself. All right, so um, um, here we go. Uh, Ashley wrote hers out, and Ashley, this is plenty acceptable. Like I said, some of the labs are going to get more elaborate than this, and this is going to become more difficult, but this is a plenty good accept, uh, uh, submission, and I love it. 10 out of 10 for you. Uh, uh, Vincent, beautiful. Vincent, picture, perfect. Operation. He even did all the little things that I did. 10 out of 10 gold star for Vincent. Okay, so do you guys start to see what I'm looking for here? You getting a sense of it all? Try not to have it rotated if you can help it. This is plenty good, Paige. Paige, this is beautiful. I like what you did. Uh, okay, yep, looking good. Um, so try not to have it sideways. I can handle it blue, Josh, but you better have all the little corrections that I did. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that I don't love. Uh, scratchy, <laughs> scratchy. Scratchy, scratchy, you can't figure out what's going on. I don't you know why you're doing you do it this time. Okay. As you, as you did it, you were like, okay, this one time. 
This one, you're right, Fred. Okay, I'm teasing you, Fred. But Fred, could you get a pencil? Make a 25 cent investment in your life. Get a pencil, get a calculator, get a ruler. You're gonna love it. Okay. Um, but Fred, you're right. This will be a 10 out of 10, a begrudging 10 out of 10. Scratchy, scratchy, don't like that, but I'll put up with it for now because it's you know the first day and all. Um, uh, um, Henna, if I'm saying that correctly, Henna's got two pages here. That's cool. I can work with you. Uh, yeah, Henna, I like this. Okay, nice, neat handwriting. Wonderful. I think it's helpful for you guys to see some different examples of different submissions because it really, I didn't understand when I was a student wh what it's like to be a teacher. I, I, of course, do now, but it's very helpful for you to get inside the mind of a teacher so you know what pisses us off and what doesn't. In general, you try not to piss us off. Okay, so did, I hope that was helpful to you guys. Uh, I am going to meet the nighttime class at 6 p.m. Caitlin, will you join in for a little bit so you can be part of that class discussion? Basically, I'm just going to say to everyone, join us during the day or watch the video at night so I don't have to repeat myself, okay? Yeah, that's fine. And I also wanted to remind you that we also have a meeting as well. All right, Caitlin, we're going to do that meeting after everyone, uh, after we stop this thing, okay? In of fact, Caitlin, I might actually have us do face, can we face, do you have an iPhone where we could FaceTime? That would be great because I want to start rendering this video so I can upload it for our night class. So in fact- Yeah, uh, I have an I have both an iPad and an iPhone, so we're good. <laughs> okay, so uh, wait, Caitlin, um, uh, here's, uh, and this is for everyone, really. You guys, there's no secret. I'm giving you my number. So when we end class, I want you to FaceTime me, and then we can have an interface about, uh, about that uh, private subjects. Um, okay, and then the rest of you guys, are you good? Do you feel good about what's happening? I'll try not to have as much glitchy stuff going on with the focus and stuff. I'm going to... I was, I was good once, I will get good again. Um, lecture, then we did a lab today. Have your calculators and a ruler and a pencil for Thursday, and we're gonna be doing homework one at the end. Sound like a plan? All right, awesome hangs, guys. Uh, great to talk to you, Mikey. Um, I'll be, uh, I'm, I'm only an email or a phone call away if you need me. I'll catch you all on the flip side. Till Thursday. I have a quick question right. about